Democracy Community. Uh, and we're super excited to start this off uh, with Nikki Stout. Uh, she is going to be giving a workshop today on uh, grant writing and uh, fundraising writing. She is on the first Mid-Atlantic board and is also a mentor on 1807. And we're super excited to see what she has to say today uh, and what we can all learn from it. So um, we'll hand it off to Nikki in a second. And um, we'll we'll talk about Beach Blitz and Okra uh, all throughout the rest of the night and the rest of the weekend. So I uh, uh, ho hope you all get to enjoy and learn a lot from this. Uh, uh, take it away, Nikki. All right. Uh do you have my slides or can I can I share my screen with my slides? Uh, you can share, you can your, share sc your screen. Yeah. You should have uh, privileges now. Let me know if you do not. All right, I take it everyone can see my screen. Sounds good? Looks good? Yep, you're good to go. All right. So hi, everyone. Um, my name is Nikki Stout. I'm a mentor on FIRST Robotics Competition Team 1807. I'm a FIRST Mid-Atlantic Board of Directors member. I was voted in this year. I'm also a FIRST alumni, and I'm an event volunteer in all the programs, not just FIRST Robotics Competition. I like to help out FIRST Tech Challenge and FIRST LEGO League as well. Um, after this, if you would like to reach out and have questions or if your team needs help, my social media is on the side. I prefer if you email me, but let's dive right in. So as a little bit of backstory, besides my first uh, stuff, I also have a certificate in nonprofit management from Drexel University, which I completed in September of this year. And as a footnote for everything I'm about to say, this all is stuff based off of pre- COVID. However, I did try to keep in mind like how COVID has changed the landscape of nonprofits and how to fundraise and how grants are functioning right now. So this is the overview of what I'm going to go over. We have our basic terminology. You have vital grant terms. We have the house of development, how to plan for grant writing with some ticks and tips and tricks for grant writing, and how to plan for fundraising with, of course, some tips and tricks for fundraising. Now, some of these slides are a little heavy when it comes to the text, and I apologize. There's just a lot of different terms, and it can get very confusing if you try to dive in and start writing without going over any of these terms beforehand. So our basic terminology, what is fundraising? It's the process of seeking and gathering voluntary financial contributions by engaging individuals, businesses, charitable foundations, or governmental agencies. So when you sell cookies or you sell some type of baked good, that could be a fundraiser if the profits are going towards a nonprofit or your robotics team. What is a grant? It's a non-repayable amount of money given to support an individual, organization, nonprofit, educational institution, business, project, or program. Basically, there are companies and organizations that go, we have $100 and we don't want the money back. We just want to make sure it does something good. So let's make sure these kids on a first Lego League team can build something for their neighbor, build something for their school. So what exactly is a nonprofit? They're organizations created for the benefit of the general public. They don't have shareholders and they only use their profits and their surplus to advance a mission. Nonprofits fall into five different categories, but we're focusing on one category. And that particular category is a 501c3. They're the largest category of charitable organizations. And these includes arts, education, healthcare, human services, and organizations that can accept tax deductible donations. Uh, this is a particular tax code and it's determined by the federal government. And you must double check that your school or organization has this determination. Some um, PTOs, some 
I, I forget in the term right now, but some parent organizations go and get this 501c3 status. So that way, when they go to purchase things for school teams or um, clubs, they don't have to pay the taxes on it and it gets deducted during tax time. So when you're an adult and you have to pay taxes, if you contribute enough money voluntarily to different organizations that are considered nonprofits, you in sense have started kind of paid in advance your taxes. It's not the best way to put it, but that's what a lot of people end up doing. And that's why you can get a lot of donations if you're a tax deductible organization. So the house of development is a very specific concept and I'm sorry, it's a little complicated. It's to help describe the structure of a nonprofit financially. So that way the nonprofit can be sustainable. Each level should build on one another with the base being an annual giving membership and events. In regards to first, your events are typically gonna be competitions, both in season and off season. And it doesn't matter if you host those events or if you just attend those events. Those are opportunities for your sponsors and for your donors to come see how their financial contributions has helped your team. Now, it doesn't just have to be first events. They can be summer camps. If your team runs summer camps, it could be if you are an FRC team that runs a first Lego league team, it could be something like that or if you just kind of do some type of community service event. Those can fall into that event section. So some important terms, and again, I'm sorry, this is very wordy and very, very overwhelming when it comes to a slideshow, but it's really hard to explain these things without just the words being there. So annual giving can be any type of unrestricted financial gain. Unrestricted meaning that someone says, here's $5, use it for whatever your nonprofit needs. Major gifts are the largest donations your organization receives in a year. If you have a corporate sponsor or a foundations that's giving you money and they give your team $10,000 and that's the most amount of money your team gets in a year, that's a major gift. A uh, planned gift is a contribution that is arranged in the present and allocated at a future date. This is typically not used for robotics teams, but it might be used for any overarching organization that helps run events in an area. A capital campaign is an intense effort on the part of a nonprofit organization to raise significant money in a specific period of time. So for the, this example, it's, hey, we qualified for championships, but now we need to be able to pay the registration fee, cover the expenses to get there. Can you help us get to championships? So the final one is a transformational gift. This one is not typically seen for FRC teams, but it's a gift that completely changes the organization. It's usually a six, seven, eight figure gift and when I say gift, I mean financial donation. And I'm sure there's some programs that might get those types of gifts, but it's not super common. So if you wanna think of it as an actual house, on the first level, you have your annual membership and giving and you have events. The next one is your corporate foundations, your major gifts and your planned gifts. And then the addict would be the capital campaigns. And then transformational gifts would be the, the roof on it. Now you'll notice there is a road leading into the house. That road is public relations, websites, social media, emails, newsletters, and then annual reports. And in this sense, I'm gonna say annual reports would be stuff like a business plan or your chairman's essay and any type of documentation you have that goes along with those items. So some vital grant terms for when you're writing grants. You have grant makers. 
Those are the people who make the funds. They're often government departments or agencies, corporations, foundations, or just people who want to give out lots of money. You have governing bodies, foundations, trusts, individuals, and corporations awarding those grants. And most grants have typically come from government agencies and foundations. I'm gonna put a giant asterisk on this and say due to the current economic climate, that is very much subject to change. We don't really know how things are going to change and we can't really predict that because everything is so up in the air. So it could turn out that there's more grant writers and grant makers that are actually corporations, but we won't know until like I'd say about a year from now. And we have some other terms. We have discretionary grants which it's federal agencies awarding funding directly to nonprofits. You have foundations, which is a type of nonprofit that exists to give money away for charitable purposes. Uh, you have corporate philanthropy, which is a for-profit company that donates some of its profits and resources to charity. And then you have donor advised funds. It's philanthropic vehicles established at a public charity, which allows donors to make a charitable contribution, receiving an immediate tax benefit, and then recommending grants from the fund over time. Don't worry about donor advised funds. You can find some of them for first teams out there, but they're not super common. So can fundraising and grant writing work together? Yes. So the materials you assemble for a grant proposal can provide guidance when developing additional fundraising initiatives. And no project or team should rely on grants entirely. And funders usually do not want to be part of a project's only source of financial support. They wanna make sure it's successful and that the money is going towards a reputable organization. So ensuring that you are doing some type of fundraising will make the grant maker more comfortable giving you that money because they know, oh, if something happens with us, we don't have to worry that we're the only people uh, basically carrying this idea or carrying this organization. And then there's also some grants that are matching. And that means you must raise the same amount of money from another source in a certain amount of time in order to win the grant. So the most important reason you should do both though, is that the funds you acquire through fundraising will also indicate to grant makers your organization is serious and committed to the project proposed and that the community supports your organization's program. So if you have a bunch of little donors trying to support your project, whether you're just trying to fund your team for the season, or maybe you are doing a side project and you wanna make sure that it is the best it possibly can be, and you're trying to get a grant for either of those things, having community support is super important. So why should we write grants? Successful grant writing offers a few different things. It's a way to attract outside funding. You can help support an organization's vision and goals and strategic grant writing looks to align identified needs of a nonprofit and its clients with funded sources, whether foundations, government agencies, corporates, or individuals. So how do you plan to write all these grants? Well, there's a few steps. When you're a team, you wanna determine your goals. What will the money be used for? How much money do you realistically need? And what metrics will you use to define success? When you're picking your metrics for success, pick a measurable but attainable goal. So an increase in students going to trade school or college from your school who participated in your programs would be a measurable and attainable goal. Don't use competition awards as a goal because they're subjective. You want something that you can quantify. You want a number behind it and you wanna have statistics. Kind of like how when you're writing chairmans, you want to show to the, the judges that your program has an impact. It's the same type of thing that grant makers are going to look for. So once you figure all that out, step two, you need to research what grants. You should review eligibility requirements 
So does your organization fit their mission for giving? Does anything about your organization disqualify you from them? Because there are some uh, grant makers that might specifically say that if you're associated with a school, then you do not qualify. And they've also had the opposite where you have to be associated with a school in order to get these grants. You should double check when the application is due. And most importantly, you should make sure you know when the money will be dispersed to you. Because if you need the money in two weeks from now, but you won't know you got the grant for four weeks, that's not gonna be very helpful. And some of them require you to complete the project before they give you the money. I understand that is frustrating, but some of them want to make sure that before you are basically paid back for all the work you have done, what you said you were gonna do was completed. So then it's time to review the application, which is also known as a request for proposal. Check how to submit it. Check to see if you need to email anyone. Before you write it, take note of all the information required for the application. There might be some things that as a robotics team, you don't necessarily check or don't keep track of, whether it's how many students got jobs after college that were on your team, or maybe your school has a policy where they can't talk about the any identifying information when it comes to statistics about how your team is. So make sure that you're not breaking any rules when it comes to that kind of stuff and you get all that stuff in advance. And of course, ensure any metrics that can be requested can be shared with outside organizations. So ensure you have all of your information and not just the metrics, have financial information, have your prior year's budgets. If you're a 501c3, have your determination letter and then you should also have a tax ID. So you should have that on there as well. You need to list all of your sponsors. So that would include any place giving you, if you are a community team and maybe you work in someone's workshop and they don't charge you rent or anything for the workshop, you would include them as a sponsor as well. And make sure you have an adult mentor's contact information so preferably a head coach, or if your team has a different type of structure, the executive director of your team, and then any requested metrics that they have already asked for. So common elements of a grant proposal. That's a cover letter, executive summary, statement of need, goals and objectives, activities, budget, organizational info, evaluation and conclusion. It's a lot, but they're usually one to two pages. So for your cover letter, you introduce your organization, you explain the mission of your team or your nonprofit, how much money you're going to request for your project, and then you describe the project and what it will accomplish and how it aligns with the grant maker's stated purpose. You want to include your contact details and you should send this on your organization, teams, schools, whatever it is, letterhead, and make sure it's signed by the adults or students that are handling the grants. Your executive summary, keep it simple. Just explain to the grant maker how you're planning on using their grant. Statement of need, again, you just have to keep it simple. Present the evidence to show, uh, to support the need for your proposed project, establish your organization's ability to address that need, outlines the challenges or problems to be solved with documented evidence, and the statement of need should convince the grant maker that your nonprofit's project or program warrants funding and can effectively address the identified problem. And then your goals and objectives. Outline what the organization looks to accomplish with its programs or project in broad terms, which are the goals, and what the concrete and specific accomplishments and objectives are. So if overall your goal is to increase participation, participation on your robotics team, one of your objectives could be increase participation in minorities 
by 50%. And you can define minority as whatever that category you would like it to be. So it's something more like that, that you would try to put in your goals and objectives. And then activities. You're gonna clearly and concisely identify the procedures, methods, and activities that will be used to meet the proposal's objectives. You wanna include a timeline showing when major activities or events will take place. So if you are trying to get funding just for your robotics team to participate in the next season, you would put your timeline on when things happen. So training could be from October to December for training new members to work on tools, do electrical programming, that kind of stuff. Then January 5th is when you find out th what the competition's gonna be. And then your first competition day is a traditionally like week two. So then you would put that time frame as how it will be or what will be built and general goals like week one, have a defined strategy on what you're gonna do for the competition. Week two of build, you're gonna have your drive kit made or built and then so on and so forth, depending on how your team functions. But you also want to explain why. So why does your organization team believe that they are using the best, me best method to achieving your objectives? Why do you think having this program is better than any other program? So next up, you will have your budget and it should reflect information already conveyed in other parts of the application and match guidelines provided by the funder. Some funders will want graphs, some will just want bullet points. It all depends on who you're applying to. You should have all listed expenses that's accompanied by an explanation. You should include all expected and secured sources of funding. And then you should make sure it is clear how their support will contribute to the completion of your organization's goal. So it should be without a doubt, if we don't get this $5,000, we won't be able to do X, Y, and Z. We'll only be able to do X with $1,000. Or if we only get $2,000, we'll be able to do most of why, but then we'll have to go and fundraise, which will take time away from our projects. So you're basically telling them, this is how much the Im impact you as the grant maker are going to make on the people who utilize this program or this nonprofit. So then you want organizational information. It's what your nonprofit does and who it serves. So you would, if you're just a robotics team, you would state that you are a competitive team that serves students in blah, blah, USA that's specifically going to the high school of blah, blah, USA. So you'd include a brief history of the organization when it was founded, um, like how, how it's impacted people thus far and that kind of stuff. And you want to make it clear to the potential funder how your organization is special. You can highlight key accomplishments, like if you have won chairman's or won specific awards, this is where you would want to highlight those things. And you can show how the organization's missions aligns with the funder's priorities, because you really want to stress to them and make sure they don't forget, hey, you are a grant maker that's supposed to help inspire kids go into STEM fields. We are a robotics team. Our missions and our priorities are the same. So you should fund us because we'll make sure that you get to accomplish your mission and we get to accomplish our mission. So the next is evaluation. You're gonna discuss how the results of your project are going to be measured. What sort of data will be collected during and at the end of the project in order to evaluate its success? That could be team growth. It could be uh, just a skills kind of test when you have some students that start off, maybe they don't know anything about engineering and at the end they know at least like the basics or they know something more advanced. And then some questions you should consider answering 
is, is this project process oriented or product oriented? If you're trying to get funding overall for your robotics team, is the goal to have a functioning robot at the end of your build season? Or is your goal to ensure that students get the most knowledge out of their build season by updating tools and equipment? Will evaluative data be qualitative or quantitative? Will there be an outside evaluator or if there will, or will, will the review be performed internally? So is there someone that maybe the school district is gonna come in and go, all right, let me give you the test here and they're gonna quiz on knowledge or will the team reflect or will whoever reflect and go, all right, how did we start this year? How did we end this year? Is there any type of improvement that meets what we said we were gonna improve on? And then your conclusion. It should be a short summary of what you already wrote about and you wanna keep it about a page long. So in grant writing, always save your responses in a separate document. I have some of my favorite kids that I have ever mentored, but a couple of times because when you're tired, you're forgetful. They of course forgot to save what they wrote in a separate document and some of the grant portals don't save your responses unless you hit submit. So you can't come back to it later. You have to do it just in one shot. So don't rush through it either. It's kind of hard to find that balance when you're, you're trying to get it done, but you don't want to rush it and you feel like there's a deadline. But you want to make sure you answer everything to the best of your ability. Just don't try to rush through it, read everything, reread it a couple times, ask other people to read it just to make sure that you have everything answered. And finally, make it heartfelt and truly tell your story. If you're a team that is only 10 students and this is the first year you've had 30 students, you should tell that type of story, how you're, inspire you're growing and you're inspiring more individuals. You wanna make sure that the grant maker doesn't just look at it as a piece of paper or some facts about this particular group, but instead has a connection and they can really feel like, oh, like these individuals truly care about what they are trying to accomplish and they truly care about their education or they truly care about whoever's education it is. We need to help them. So you wanna kind of just drive that emotional response in the grant maker. So how to plan for fundraising. It's going to seem pretty simple or similar to grant making or in grant writing. So step one, you're going to plan for your fundraising. As a team or organization, you need to determine your goals. So just like grant making and grant writing, what will the money be used for? How much will you need? How will you define success? Will it be a financial success or an awareness success? If you're trying just to make sure that people know what your robotics team does, or maybe you just wanna make sure that other individuals know that this is an option for their students, that would be more awareness. If you have a, a money goal that you need to reach, financial, of course. But also think of the timing. When do you wanna start your fundraiser and what could prevent a fundraiser from being started? So there are some schools that their administration requires teams to, or, or any school organization, they have to submit a letter and submit the idea to the administration to make sure that no other organization or team is doing something similar so the two aren't competing against each other. So if football is doing a cookie sale or a bake sale, for the month of October, then the robotics team might not be allowed to do a cookie or bake sale either. So then what else could you do during that time to start raising money? So it's some stuff like that you really wanna think about before you just start diving into fundraising. And step two, research. Uh, some schools don't let you fundraise. I know it sounds really weird, but I've met students on various teams that are not allowed to fundraise. 
because it's affiliated with the school and the school doesn't want for whatever reason they just think that allowing an organization to fundraise and not use the funds that the school has is a bad idea i don't understand it but that's a step you got to take is make sure you are allowed to fundraise and then step two is double check where you can have money sent and saved for your team does your school have a shared bank account can your team utilize a parent booster club and does your team fall under its own or another 501c3 and then see if there are local laws and permits and banned fundraisers so when you're thinking maybe you could do a, a raffle for a gift basket or something, double check to see if it's considered gambling. In some states, certain uh, fundraisers are considered gambling and they're not allowed. Others require permits before you are allowed to start fundraising. Uh, I know in New Jersey, you had to get a specific permit to have a bake sale. And if you didn't, you had to return all the money and you would be fined. And then some places have banned other various types of fundraisers for whatever reason they felt like banning them. So step three, it's write your story. Think of your target audience. So think of who you want to donate. Do you want parents to donate? Do you want the community at large to donate? Are you trying to entice maybe some teachers to donate? and be super specific about who you want to donate. Don't just say, we want everyone to donate. Think about who you're really gonna wanna interact and who you think is really gonna want to participate in these things. And then showcase your why. Keep your goal in mind and also make it memorable and heartfelt. So just like with trying to persuade grant makers and grant writers, you want to make it as heartfelt as you possibly can. And if you are doing some fundraising and you already have this heartfelt message written, it can be the same one used for the grant writing. So be honest when you're writing your, your why and keep it simple. Try to use statistics and data to back them up. And then focus less on acquiring the money and more on spreading the message. If you make it entirely about the money and yes, fundraising, you are trying to make money, but if you just focus on the money, you lose the important part about why you're fundraising. And that's exactly it, the why. If you're just spreading the message and saying, hey, we're participating in this organization that offers $80 million worth of scholarships and provides different opportunities for students all over the globe, people are gonna be more interested in how they can help with that over just, hey, can you give us $5 for our fundraiser? So again, plan for your fundraiser. Are you just asking for money? Cause some people do do that where it's like, hey, we're part of this program. We, we really just need some money for it, but let me tell you why you should donate. And then you have, Will you try to sell items in return for a donation? If yes, and it's an in-the-box style fundraiser, check to see how much money you have to make and how much product you must sell. If you're doing like a, a bunt cake style fundraiser, some of them require that you sell 10 cakes before you see any type of profit. Others are even more ridiculous, like certain coupon books, you have to sell 100 just to get 25% of the money back. And then if no, can you incorporate it into something your team can learn from or do together? So my team ran last year, this water bottle fundraiser. We bought a bunch of um, like metal water bottles and we had a laser cutter that had the engraver on it. So we would engrave the team logo or the school logo. And then for extra money, we would put people's names on it. They can customize it a little bit and that was a fun way to teach our freshmen how to use the laser cutter. And it also got more people involved, not just the business side of the team, like interested in fundraising and interested more in the business aspect of it. So 
When you're starting your fundraiser, have a set start date and ensure all students and mentors are aware of the messaging and approve of it before the start date. You don't wanna have someone on the team when an individual goes, hey, I wanna buy a water bottle. And then the person on the team goes, what are you talking about? I have no idea. Like, We're selling water bottles, no one told me. It looks pretty bad. So have all necessary info on hand. If you need to give every kid like a flyer of frequently asked questions, do that if you have to. And if you're struggling as mentors to get students involved, try gamification, try turning it into a game. Whoever hits $10 first and, and they get like a gift card or they get a pencil or they decide on the team building day what two of the activities are gonna be that day. But don't make it a requirement because some students just might not be able to actually help and that's okay. We, we don't want to discourage them and make individuals feel like if they can't fundraise, then they can't be part of the team. That's not okay. We want to encourage them to try to help out if they can, but don't worry about it if they can't. And if your school allows for use of digital methods, utilize them. You have donors choose, which is fantastic, especially if you're a teacher. You have Facebook. Facebook has some awesome ways to do fundraising. Twitter has similar ways to do fundraising. Instagram also can do fundraising because it's owned by Facebook, but it ends up just being a Facebook fundraiser anyways. And there's other websites as well. If you're a 501c3, you can go on Tiltify and that is one that works with live streams. They also work on TikTok as a fundraising method, though it's really hard to get in that beta program but I think they might open it up soon. I'm not entirely sure. So when fundraising, keep track of all the sales and all the donations and be as detailed as possible. Make sure you get people's first name, last name, and a way to contact them because you want to send them a thank you letter later. And then offer a way for donors to connect digitally and or physically. You can have them connect via team social media page, you can collect their email addresses or physical addresses depending on your location and just to send follow-up information. So when your fundraiser is done with, you should send a note like an email or a notice, go, hey, thank you for donating. Because of your donation and the collective donations of everyone, we raised $3,000 and now we can afford to buy some new drills and the parts needed to build a robot this year. So. When following up, once a grant is awarded or a fundraiser is complete, share the news of your success with your stakeholders, donors, and the internet. Be proud. Even if you only raise like $30, you still should be proud that you raised some money. You should thank grant makers and donors by sending a thank you letter. For grants, you should follow up quickly and establish the next steps. And for fundraisers, send promise gifts, trinkets for their donation and send follow-up letters to donors at least halfway through the completion of the project they donated towards and once it's complete. So that would be halfway through build season. You wanna let them know like the strategy, any parts that have been made, any like significant things that have happened. If you are asking for funding for a specific project that wasn't related to build season, just let them know how it's going you wanna keep them involved as possible and make them truly feel like they have done something incredible and that their contribution is going to go a long way. And if you didn't get the grant, still follow up with key decision makers. A lot of the time they're gonna give you feedback. So you should ask for the feedback so you can improve your application. You can ask what deficiencies there were in the grant proposals, you can See how you can strengthen your argument for the grant and make sure to thank the program officer for their time. There's a good chance it's gonna be the same person that you apply to next year if you decide to go for that same grant. You wanna leave them with a good feeling and that you aren't upset about it and just be as professional and level-headed as possible. Cause you never know, they could then next year go, hey, the, these high school kids took it very well that we didn't give them the grant last year. I think we should award it to them this year because they were so professional. So we finally hit some pro tips. 
have an online presence. It could be social media, blog, website, newsletters, and use your goals to set the tone of your marketing and the messaging on all of your online presence. So if your goal is to inspire kids to pursue STEM, your marketing should reflect that. Your images should have kids working on robots or kids working on programming, learning the different skill sets and whatnot. You should have playbooks. So those are defined written processes that don't change from year to year, like ordering team shirts, running an annual summer camp, make it easy, not just for the new individuals coming onto your team to learn how to do things, but also if a grant writer or, or a funder or donor goes, hey, I want to see how you do this process, you have it readily available and you're not scrambling to try to get the information you need to them. And then see what other first teams are doing on social media. There's so many teams out there and all of them are doing different things and they're all very innovative in their own ways. It's totally fine to follow other teams. I highly suggest it. And not only other teams, but also the different program partners if they do have social media. You can learn a lot about how different areas do different things and you might be inspired to try a different fundraiser or try to change and tweak things that you do to keep making your team and things that your team do a lot better. So if you have your own 501c3 status, set up fundraising via social media platforms and your website. You can try using PayPal. It has a transaction fee of 2.2% plus 30 cents and allows donates, donors to donate to specific programs. So if you're an organization that has an FRC team, an FTC team and an FLL team, you can divvy it up based on the team. So you don't have to go back into your books and figure out, hey, who donated for the Lego League team? So I know exactly how much Lego League has. And if you don't have one or it's connected to a group of organizations, you can create a web page with easy to understand instructions on how someone can donate. And don't forget to create a form to get their contact information to follow up. And treat donated items the same as a financial donation. If your team is fortunate enough to have a lathe, whether it's brand new or used, donated, that's a lot of money that your team just saved because that's a very expensive piece of equipment. You should figure out how much it is worth and treat it as an equal financial donation. So if you put sponsors on the back of your shirt that donate $100 or more and someone donated $200 worth of tools or parts, put them on the back of your shirt as well. You wanna make them feel just as special. And you should utilize first resources. There's this great organization called the Compass Alliance that has a bunch of information on fundraising and PR. And of course, FIRST has a fundraising toolkit, which you can find at the link firstinspires.org slash research dash library slash fundraising toolkit. Questions? Yeah, so I'm going to read some questions from the chat. Um, we can turn off the share screen so we can see your beautiful face, if that's okay. <laughs> Perfectly fine. <laughs> All right. Cool. Let me just turn my camera on. Yep, I'll turn mine on too so you're not alone. And we'll pin you. All I right. cannot start my video because the host has stopped it. Oh, well, that should work what I just asked. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's all new in this virtual format. All right. It's okay. Things happen. Things happen. All right. Cool. So the first question is more geared towards, I guess, Beach Blitz. They asked uh, if the PowerPoint and recording will be available later. The recording will be available later if Nikki wants to post her PowerPoint. That's her. That's her question. <laughs> yes, I will be more than happy to share this PowerPoint. Anyone who wants it can have it. Awesome. All right, so first real question, um, who asks this? Seg8595 from Twitch asks, for a donor, what's the difference between restricted and unrestricted FRC grants? So restricted typically means that there is something the grant writer or the donor wants to have happen. So some might be that if it's restricted, it's like, oh, you can only use this for parts. You can't use this for any type of um, like, like basically to pay the 
the fee to enter. You might have some that say, we will only give you this money if it's gonna be used to pay the registration fee. You can't use this for parts. A lot of grants surprisingly have a stipulation that says it cannot be used for travel or food. So any money fundraised, you probably wanna leave it unrestricted so that way you can cover any student's food that needs covered, any travel that your team has to do. Cause I understand that like traveling to regionals and traveling to district championships and worlds, very expensive. But if you get a grant and it's worth $20,000 but you can't use it for travel, why don't kind of put yourself in a crappy situation where you're like, I have all this money but I literally cannot use it for what I need it. Makes sense. Um, to add on to that, the same question, it's kind of the same question, but secondary part of it is, does the donating organization get tax benefits with restricted that unrestricted doesn't give? Regardless of if it's restricted or unrestricted, you're going to get tax benefits from it. So as long as it's a donation, it's, it's tax deductible usually. You just have to have that 501c3 status in order to ensure that person gets that tax deductible and you have to give them a receipt too. Okay, cool. All right, next question from Nico. With everything going on today, has anything changed with the tax credits related to 501c3 grants? Not yet. We're in this weird period where taxes just had changed last year and there's only, it's now like only 12% or something like that can count. It's a weird law at this point. And I know that some individuals are looking into changing that law again because it went against nonprofits and it actually hurt the nonprofit industry. So it's up in the air, unfortunately. And it's also a very complicated mathematical equation that they have. And I, I realize like we're talking to people who understand math and whatnot, but I don't have that on the top of my head. <laughs> All right. Awesome. All right. Um, next up is from Hannah Woohoo. She's very excited. Uh, what are the best websites to publish a newsletters with? So my robotics team uses HubSpot for our email. We're thinking about switching over to HubSpot for our website as well, because they offer 20 free landing pages now. And a landing pages is just like this static page where you go to like a home page or an about us page or even it could just be a form to collect your email and your information that way another one would be mailchimp it's the only issue with mailchimp i found it tends to go to people's spam inbox because there's so many people who use mailchimp because it's a free option so i like hubspot you could also i think use something like salesforce but i think salesforce costs money so i would recommend the free options before you go for something that costs money. Yeah, our MailChimp so is going spam too. So I definitely <laughs> feel you there. Um, those are all the questions we have so far. We'll, we'll wait a sec for the Twitch stream to catch up. If anyone has more questions, feel free. The workshop ends in three minutes. So if you have questions, ask them now. Hannah Woohoo says, oh, thank you, by the way, Nikki. <laughs> You're very welcome. <laughs> um, I'll give it a little bit. All right. Okay, I think everyone is good on their questions. So thank you so much, Nikki. That was an amazing presentation. I actually learned quite a lot and I've been doing this for a long time. So <laughs> awesome presentation. Thanks for um, doing this for Beach Blitz. I know it's crazy being online and all over the country, but thank you so much. It's perfectly fine. I'm so happy that I got to help. I hope everyone that tuned in learned something. Again, I'm sorry that it's so wordy, but this is a subject that there's just so much terminology that it has to be wordy. And I hope everyone appreciated just any type of knowledge that y'all could take away from this. So thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. See ya. Bye. Bye. Okay.
So we'll do a brief intermission, go get some food, go get